The Story So Far In 1980, just four years after being founded in a California garage, Apple was the biggest maker of PCs in the world. Computer giant IBM was not amused and fought back, launching its own PC in 1981. Though built from copycat technology, IBM's PC was an enormous hit and spawned many imitators, the PC clones. But PCs were still a pain to use. A revolution was needed to make them friendlier. Now, view on. and gentlemen, welcome to the launch of Windows 95. Yes, welcome Microsoft. It's nice to have you all here. But now let's welcome the chairman of Microsoft. Listen to this. This is a man, a man so successful, his chauffeur is Ross Perot, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Bill Gates. It's August 24th, 1995, in a suburb of Seattle in the Pacific Northwest. This is the biggest, noisiest product launch in the history of the personal computer. It's Windows 95 software, and Bill Gates is the star, chairman, chief nerd, and spiritual leader of Microsoft. But the truth is... This is the latest step in Bill's dream to have his software running on every PC in the world. We wanted people to be able to appreciate how Windows 95 makes computing faster, easier, and more fun. And for seven years, it was a lonely, lonely crusade. Reality police. This moves the whole PC industry up to a whole new level. Wait a minute. All this publicity is so Bill Gates can claim that Windows 95 is the latest and perhaps most significant improvement in the PC since it was invented. He can say that his new operating system makes PCs nicer to look at and easier to use than ever before. They'll no longer be just for geeks and nerds. They'll be so easy to use that even my mother will want one. But you know what? Most of the ideas in Windows 95 were invented 20 years ago. The 20-year journey to this software celebration hasn't been easy. It has involved huge gambles, passionate commitment, dramatic setbacks, and required the occasional crushing of rivals and allies. It's the triumph of Bill Gates' commercial vision. Success in the marketplace doesn't have to come from innovation or from being the best if you have a ruthless ability to exploit your opportunities. And the way Microsoft made the PC's graphical user interface its own is a textbook example of that ability. Time for another cringely crash course in elementary computing. In the early days of personal computing, the machines were pretty hard to use. In part, that's because they were primitive, but it's also because computer guys tend to like things that are pretty hard to use. This is an IBM PC circa about 1983, and on it, I've written a letter to my bank manager asking him to back one of my get-rich-quick schemes. I need to file the letter now, and let me show you how I do it. There will be a test on this. Okay, the commands are copy C colon backslash quick rich dot doc space A colon backslash begging and return. Well, not very easy to do. Here's a Windows PC about 12 years newer, and we'll do exactly the same thing. I've written a document, quick rich dot doc and I put it in the begging file and it, yes, I really do mean to do it and that's it. Pictures rather than words making the PC easy and intuitive. This is called a graphical user interface, GUI or GUI. Where they come up with these names? 
The battle to bring GUIs to PCs and make them more user-friendly took 10 years and is a hell of a story. That's what this program is about. It's also about how Bill Gates ended up master of the GUI universe and a gazillionaire. I never said it was a fairy story. It all began in 1971 in Palo Alto, just south of San Francisco, when Xerox, the copier company, set up the Palo Alto Research Center, or PARC. Xerox management had a sinking feeling that if people started reading computer screens instead of paper, Xerox was in trouble. Unless they could dominate the paperless office of the future. You could take uh, computer technology into the office and make the office a much better place to work. More productive, uh, more enjoyable, a lot more enjoyable, um, more interesting, more rewarding. Uh, and so we set to work on it. Bob Taylor ran Park's computer science lab, and one of the first things he did was to buy bean bags for his researchers to sit on and brainstorm. These are a couple of uh, the original beanbag chairs. Uh, the role of the beanbag chair in computer science is ease of use. Okay. It was said that of the top 100 computer researchers in the world, 58 worked at Park. Strange as the staff never exceeded 50. But Taylor gave these nerd geniuses unlimited resources and protected them from commercial pressures. It's very comfortable. Now let's see you get out of it. I feel my, my neural capacity already increasing. There you go. Oh, God. <laughs> the atmosphere at Park was electric. Uh, there was total intellectual freedom. There was no conventional wisdom. Uh, almost every idea was up for challenge and got challenged regularly. The management said, go create the new world. We don't understand it. Here are people who have a lot of ideas and tremendous talent, young, energetic. People came there specifically to work on five-year programs that were their dreams. This is a computer room in the basement of the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. About 25 years ago, they built the Max time-sharing system in here, and now it's loaded with all sorts of other computers. And uh, there's one that we're really interested in here. Let's see. Here it is. Let me, let me turn on the lights. Okay. Here we have it. This is a Xerox Alto computer. Uh, built around 1973. Some people would argue that this is the first personal computer. Uh, it really isn't because for one thing it, it wasn't ever for sale and the parts alone cost about $10,000 but it has all the elements of a, quite a modern personal computer and without it we wouldn't have the Macintosh, we wouldn't have Windows, we wouldn't have most of the things we value in computing today. And ironically none of those things has a Xerox name on it. What's the mail this morning? This promotional film made in the mid-70s to flaunt Xerox Park research shows just how revolutionary the Alto was. It was friendly and intuitive. This is an experimental office system. It's in use now. It had the first GUI using a mouse to point to information on the screen. It was linked to other PCs by a system called Ethernet, the first computer network. And what you saw on the screen was precisely what you got on your laser printer. It was way ahead of its time. Thank you, Fred. Everybody wanted to make a real difference. We really thought we were changing the world and that at the end of this uh, project or the set of projects, personal computing would burst on the scene exactly the way we had envisioned it and take everybody by total surprise. But the brilliant researchers at Park could never persuade Xerox management that their vision was accurate. Head office in New York ignored the revolutionary technologies they owned 3,000 miles away. They just didn't get it. And none of the main body of the company was prepared to accept the answers. So there was a tremendous mismatch between the management and what the researchers were doing in that these guys had never fantasized about what the future of the office was going to be and when it was presented to them, they had no mechanisms for turning those ideas into real life products. And, and that, was, that was really the frustra frustrating part of it because you were talking to people who didn't understand the vision. And yet the vision was getting created every day within the, the Palo Alto Research Center, and there was no one to receive that vision. But a few miles down the road from Palo Alto was a man ready to share the vision. The most dangerous man in Silicon Valley sits in an office in this building. 
People love him and hate him, often at the same time. For 10 years, by sheer force of will, he made the personal computer industry follow his direction. With this guy, we're not talking about someone driven by the profit motive and a desire for an opulent retirement at the age of 40. No, we're talking holy war. We're talking rivers of blood and fields of dead martyrs to the cause of greater computing. We're talking about a guy who sees the personal computer as his tool for changing the world. We're talking about Steve Jobs. Hi, I'm Steve Jobs. When I wasn't sure what the word charisma meant, I met Steve Jobs and then I knew. Steve Jobs is on my eternal heroes list. There's nothing he can ever do to get off it. He wanted you to be great. And he wanted you to create something that was great. And he was going to make you do that. He's also uh, uh, obnoxious. And uh, this comes from his high standards. He has extremely high standards, and he has no patience with people who don't either share those standards or perform to them. And I'm also one of these people that I, I don't really care about being right, you know. I just care about success. Steve Jobs had co-founded Apple Computer in 1976. The first popular personal computer, the Apple II, was a hit and made Steve Jobs one of the biggest names in a brand new industry. At the height of Apple's early success in December 1979, Jobs, then all of 24, had a privileged invitation to visit Xerox Park. And they showed me really uh, three things. But I was so blinded by the first one that I didn't even really see the other two. Uh, one of the things they showed me was object-oriented programming. They showed me that, but I didn't even see that. The other one they showed me was really a networked computer system. They had over 100 Alto computers, all networked, using email, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even see that. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. Now, remember, it was very flawed. What we saw was incomplete. They'd done a bunch of things wrong, but we didn't know that at the time. It's still, though, they had the germ of the, of the idea was there, and they'd done it very well. And within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this someday. It was a turning point. Jobs decided this was the way forward for Apple. He came back and I almost said asked, but the truth is demanded that his entire programming team get a demo of the Smalltalk system. And the then head of the Science Center asked me to give the demo because Steve specifically asked for me to give the demo. And I said, no way. I had a big argument with the Xerox executives telling them that they were about to give away the kitchen sink. And um, I said I would only do it if I were ordered to do it, because then it, of course, would be their responsibility. And that's what they did. The mouse is a pointing device that moves a cursor around the display screen. Adele and her colleagues showed the Apple programmers an Alto machine running a graphical user interface. A selected window displays above other windows, much like placing a piece of paper on top of a stack on a desk. The visitors from Apple saw a computer that was designed to be easy to use, a machine that anybody could operate and find friendly, even the French. I think mostly what we got in that hour and a half uh, it was inspiration and basically just sort of a, a bolstering of our convictions that um, the, a, a more graphical way to do things um, would make the, this business computer more accessible. After an hour looking at demos, they understood our technology and what it meant more than any Xerox executive understood it after years of showing it to them. Basically, they were copier heads that just had no clue about uh, a computer or what it could do. And so they, they just grabbed, uh, grabbed defeat from the greatest victory in the computer industry. Xerox could have owned the entire computer industry today. Um, could have been, you know, a company ten times its size. Could have been IBM. Could have been the IBM of the 90s. Could have been the Microsoft of the 90s. 
For Steve Jobs, the road to Damascus passed through Palo Alto. He persuaded the Apple board to invest in technology copying what he'd seen at Xerox Park, his instrument of change. They hired a hundred engineers and started developing a new PC codenamed Lisa. But there were problems. The Lisa didn't work properly and its price tag was heading toward $10,000. Way too much for the average PC buyer. Jobs' domineering style drove everyone nuts too, so the board ousted him from his own pet project. You know, I, I brooded for a few months. But it, it, was, it was not very long after that that it really occurred to me that if we didn't do something here, the Apple II was running out of gas. And we needed to do something with this technology fast or else Apple might cease to exist as the company that it was. Jobs got his answer from Jeff Raskin, Apple employee number 31. Raskin's idea was a $600 computer, as easy to use as a toaster, codenamed Macintosh, after America's favorite Apple. Jobs liked the price, but not Raskin's design ideas. So Steve took over the Macintosh project, determined to make it a cheaper Lisa. And so I formed a small team to do the Macintosh, and, you know, we... We were on a mission from God, you know, to save Apple. While Jobs pursued his Mac mission, he needed a more orthodox chief executive to run the company, a respectable face who could sell to corporate America. He chose Pepsi-Cola executive John Scully. Scully refused. Leave Pepsi for a four-year-old company that had been set up in a garage? Are you serious? But it was hard saying no to Steve Jobs. And then he looked up at me and just stared at me with this stare that only Steve Jobs has. And he said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? And I just gulped because I knew I would wonder for the rest of my life you know, what I would have missed. Yeah, well, or you <laughs> For the young Mac team, team average, average age 21, exactly this was the start of the toughest but most exhilarating assignment of their lives, relentlessly driven by Jobs' ego. Some, oh, look at this. And who's this fresh-faced young guy here? That's me uh, 11 years ago. Had more hair, I guess. A little thinner. Oh, I love these people. Uh, they're, they're like family to me, really. Um, there, and, and we were united by this common bond of trying to do this incredible thing with the Mac. Jobs wanted the Mac to revolutionize the PC market, so he insisted that the team deliver perfection. Steve was upset that the Mac took too long to boot, to boot up when you first turned it on. So he tried motivating Larry Kenyon by telling him, well, you know, you know how many millions of people are going to buy this machine? There's going to be millions of people. And let's, let's imagine that you can make it boot five seconds faster. Well, that's five seconds times a million every day. That's 50 li lifetimes. You're, you, if you can shave five seconds off that, you're, you're saving, saving 50 lives. Uh, and so, you know, it was a nice way of thinking about it. <laughs> and we did get it to go faster. And then this is one of the uh, very first Macintosh wire wraps. This is uh -huh. wire wrap board number four. Wire As the Mac progressed, the new features were being continually added. Jobs Mac said the Mac had to be insanely great and pushed his engineers to the limit. He had to, because by early 1983, Apple was in trouble. And this is what was giving Apple such a headache. IBM's first PC launched in August 1981. It was a runaway success. Within a couple of years, more than two million units had been shipped, overtaking Apple and making Big Blue the biggest player in the market. When IBM personal computer owners look for good software, where can they turn? To IBM. What was driving IBM PC sales was software. Business programs, entertainment, Productivity, education. But software for an IBM wouldn't run on the Mac. If the Macintosh was to succeed, Jobs needed killer applications. Enter 25-year-old software supremo, Bill Gates. At that time, his company, Microsoft, had 100 workers and was growing like crazy thanks to DOS, the operating system that drove the IBM PC. But DOS sure wasn't a GUI. Gates and his aggressive number two, Steve Ballmer, were immediately intrigued by the Mac. Jobs talked to Bill at some industry conference and said, hey, we're doing, I think Lisa was sort of in development, he said, but I'm going to do the graphical 
interface machine here at Apple. Not just that Lisa thing, Bill. I'm going to do the one, the one that's really going to be the, the winner. While the Mac was being developed, Jobs staged an event, a parody of a TV game show to whip up enthusiasm among software developers. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Macintosh software dating game. Jobs got the three top software bosses of the time to sing the Mac's praises. One of them was Bill Gates. Steve didn't realize he was opening the door to the man who'd proved to be Apple's main rival. When, when was your first date with Macintosh? We've been working with the Mac uh, for almost two years now. And we put some of our, our really good people on it. And uh, even before we finished our work on the IBM PC, uh, Steve Jobs came and talked about what he wanted to do, that he thought he could do sort of a Lisa but cheaper. We said, boy, we'd love to help out. The Lisa had all its own applications, but of course they required a lot of memory. Uh, and we thought we could do better. And so Steve signed a deal with us uh, to actually provide bundled applications for the first Mac. And so we were big believers in the Mac Apples and what, red, what Steve was doing there. IBM's blue. If Most people don't remember, but until the Mac, Microsoft was not in the applications business. It was dominated by Lotus. And Microsoft took a big gamble to write for the Mac. And so uh, we got started in, in early 1982 on our Macintosh uh, software effort. And I think at that point in time, you know, it really clicked with Bill that, you know, graphic user interface was going to be the way, the way of the future. But while Bill was having his own GUI revelation, Jobs believed that Apple's true enemy was IBM. Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry? The entire information age? was George Orwell right about 1984. Despite Steve Jobs' showmanship, the IBM PC was hurting Apple's business. And most pundits considered that uh, Apple was going to be out of business. You know, in a few short months, Business Week ran an article on their cover saying, um, it's over, IBM has won. The Mac team saw themselves as Apple's pirates, but the gang was now being called on to save the ship, as the Apple II was losing precious market share. In the case of the Macintosh team, um, they were behind schedule in getting the Mac out, which is not unusual in high technology. Um, and so just getting that product to market was extremely important. After many delays, a date for the launch of the Mac was announced. The pressure of the deadline was mounting, but Steve was still a perfectionist. No design issue was too small, and it was never too late to do it right. Oh, it was a pressure cooker. We were working until, until we finished. We couldn't go to sleep or anything. I was up for three days before in, in that very last push. And uh, finally, just the stars aligned, and the last release we made at 6 a.m. that morning. It was now all or nothing because Lisa had turned out an expensive flop. The fate of the whole company seemed to rest on the launch of the Mac. John Scully had even authorized a $15 million advertising campaign to coincide with the Mac's public unveiling, January 24, 1984. I remember uh, how nervous Steve was uh, before the introduction of the Macintosh. And the rehearsal the night before was a total disaster. Um, nothing seemed to go right. Steve was upset at everybody. Uh, we wondered how in the world we were ever going to get through the introduction the following day. But when that moment came, uh, Steve was a master showman. There have only been two milestone products in our industry. The Apple II in 1977 and the IBM PC in 1981. Today, one year after Lisa, we are introducing the third industry milestone product, Macintosh. Many of us have been working on Macintosh for over two years now, and it has turned out insanely great. You've just seen some pictures of Macintosh. Now I'd like to show you Macintosh in person.
The Macintosh was undoubtedly the first affordable personal computer with a genuine graphical user interface. It was also the first computer to be a monument to one man's ego. Forget the brilliant work done at Xerox PARC and the innovations borrowed from the Lisa. On the day, only one man was claiming paternity for the Mac. So it is with considerable pride that I introduce a man who's been like a father to me, Steve Jobs. I was standing off stage, and as he came off, uh, he said, this is you know, the proudest, happiest moment of my life. And it was all over his face, it clearly was, because um, he had launched a revolution. Ultimately, it comes down to taste. It comes down to trying to expose yourself to the best things that humans have done, and then try to bring those things in to what you're doing. I mean, Picasso had a saying, he said, good artists copy, great artists steal. And we have, you know, always been shameless about stealing great ideas. Um, and I think part of what made the Macintosh great was that the people working on it were musicians and poets and artists and zoologists and historians who also happened to be the best computer scientists in the world. With delusions of grandeur running rampant, Apple created a Hollywood-style TV commercial. It symbolized how the friendly Mac would free us from the Orwellian tyranny of clunky IBM PCs. Please. With one will, one resolve, one cause. Despite the hype, by late 1984, the Mac's sales were disastrous. This is a highly sophisticated office computer. In ad after ad, Apple desperately pointed out that the Mac was far easier to use than the IBM PC, but it sold for $2,500, a thousand more than the IBM. And despite Jobs' best efforts in recruiting software makers like Bill Gates, applications were scarce. It didn't do very much. We had Mac Paint and Mac Write uh, were our, our only applications. And the market started to figure this out. Um, by the end of the year, people said, well, maybe the uh, IBM PC isn't as easy to use or is not as attractive as the Macintosh, but it actually does something which we want to be able to do, spreadsheets, word processing, and database. And so we started to see the sales of the Mac tail off towards the end of 1984, um, and, and that became a problem the following year. Cringely's third law of personal computing was right again. To succeed, a PC must have an application which alone justifies buying the whole box. The IBM PC had Lotus 123. The Mac needed its killer application. WYSIWYG, another bunch of initials from the world of the nerds. What you see is what you get. So what's the big deal? Well, it turns out that it's very hard to print on paper exactly the same image that you see on the computer screen. 80% of our brain is devoted to processing visual data, but that's not the same for computers. I've been here writing a letter to my mom, and I'm signing it Bob in 72-point uh, uh, times Roman italic type, as befitting myself. And then when I tell it to print, what comes out is a Bob, but certainly not the Bob that I'd intended. Until someone invented a way to print exactly what was on the screen, GUI would be, well, a lot of hooey. Apple's problem was the dot matrix printer. It gave everything a typewriter quality. But salvation was at hand, and once again, it owed a lot to Xerox PARC. One of PARC's former brains, John Warnock, had invented a technology that allowed a laser printer to print exactly, precisely what was on your screen. He started a company called Adobe to market his invention. And what we had figured out how to do that no one else had figured out how to do is drive laser printers. Within two or three weeks, uh, we had canceled our internal project. A bunch of people wanted to kill me over this, but we did it. And uh, I had cut a deal with Adobe to use their software, and we bought 19.9% of Adobe at Apple. 
the investment paid off. The power of precise laser-printed images and a user-friendly GUI gave birth to a brand new business, desktop publishing. The spreadsheet had made us all accountants. Now, using breakthrough software, we could create fancy artwork, snappy-looking notepaper, even counterfeit money. The Mac had found its killer application and would soon become the PC of choice for any creative business. It changed my life. My, just that one, that one instant when I picked up the mouse, my whole, my whole life changed to building a career as a computer artist. The success of desktop publishing came too late for Apple's founder. In 1985, Mac sales were still flat, but Jobs refused to believe the numbers. He simply behaved as if the Mac was a hot seller from the start. The grandiose plans of what Macintosh were going to be was just so far out of whack with the truth of what the product was doing. And the truth of what the product was doing was not horrible. It was salvageable. But the gap between the two was just so unthinkable that somebody had to do something, and that somebody was John Scully. John Scully, whom Jobs saw as his own creation, presented the board with his strategy to save the company. The plan did not include Steve Jobs. The, the board had to make a, a choice, and I said, look, it's Steve's company. Uh, I was brought in here to help. You know? uh, if you want him to run it, that's fine with me. Um, but you know, we've got to at least decide what we're going to do, and everyone's got to get behind it. But he took it as a personal attack, uh, started attacking Scully, uh, in which create, you know, backed himself into a corner, because uh, he was sure that the board would support him and not Scully. And um, ultimately, after the board talked with Steve and talked with me, um, the decision was that we would um, go forward with um, my plans, and Steve left. Um. What can I say? I hired the wrong guy. That was Scully? Yeah. And uh, he destroyed everything I'd spent 10 years working for, um, starting with me. But that wasn't the saddest part. Uh, I would have gladly left Apple if Apple would have turned out like I'd wanted it to. People in the company had very mixed feelings about it. Everyone had been terrorized by Steve Jobs at some point or another, and so there was a certain relief that the terrorist would be gone. And on the other hand, I think there was incredible respect for Steve Jobs by the very same people. And we were all very worried what would happen to this company without the visionary, without the founder, without the, char without the charisma. Apple never recovered from losing Steve. Steve was the heart and soul and driving force. It would be quite a different place today. Uh, they lost their, uh, their soul. The years after Steve Jobs left were the most profitable for Apple Computer. Apple people worked hard, they played hard. They made the computer business look like a beach party. And with a median age of 27, the company was very sexy too. Maybe too sexy. There was so much sleeping around that they came up with a travel policy back then that men would share rooms with other men on the road and women with other women just to settle it down a bit. They applied the California lifestyle to the computer industry and the computer industry would never be the same again. Leading the forces of freedom is Macintosh. In this bizarre promo to inspire their sales force, Apple stressed that the Mac's ease of use could liberate the pathetic prisoners of the IBM PC. We'll fight them in the office and the classroom and the desktop with superior weapons. With improvements to the hardware and the boom in desktop publishing, Mac production went into overdrive. By 1987, Apple was selling a million a year, IBM numbers. Let's go get them. The Mac minted money. Half its $2,000 price was pure profit. Hello, I am Macintosh. Apple arrogantly assumed their stuff was so good, consumers would always pay a premium for it. Big mistake. 
the Mac really ought to have won the battle for the desktop. Okay, it was more expensive than an IBM PC, but if what you wanted was a friendly, easy to use system, and surely everyone wanted that, then this was the only game in town. At least that's what the boys at Apple thought. But they weren't reckoning on one man, Bill Gates. Gates saw that the Mac's GUI represented a long-term threat to Microsoft's money machine, to DOS, the clunky operating system that sat inside every IBM PC. So Bill had his boys create a GUI that sat on top of DOS, rather like building a fancy facade on an old building. They called it Windows, and it wasn't much at first, but it was good enough to defend the DOS franchise. February or March of 1984, which was just right after the Apple Macintosh had been introduced. And at that point in time, it was, we were firmly convinced that we needed to bet on graphic user interface, first with the Macintosh and then with Windows. At Microsoft, it was a long and often frustrating struggle to find a GUI solution that challenged the Mac. I know the feeling. For years, teams of Microsofties slaved in their windowless offices to build windows, refreshed by an endless supply of free sodas. I mean, I was the development manager for Windows 1.0, and, you know, we kept slogging and slogging, and, yeah, it took us, I don't know, about seven versions, but it took us a few versions to get things right before 1990, that's right. Windows may at first have been a joke compared to the Mac, but Gates is persistent. Slowly, it got better, and the guys at Apple got worried. As each new feature appeared on the Windows GUI, the more they thought Microsoft was copying the features on the Mac. So finally, they sued Microsoft, accusing them in a long legal battle of stealing the look and feel of Apple's GUI. The look and feel, which is how it looks, the experience of using it, was not patentable, but it was copyrightable. But there was no precedent law. This was going to be a precedent-setting case. But it was a period of five years where you know, Microsoft, uh, our whole strategy, would have been ruined uh, because Windows was very important to us. They weren't going to change anything. And um, they were going to get us to cave in or take us all the way to the Supreme Court on this thing. We assumed that the lawyers, the judges, would all come to the right conclusion, which, which eventually they did. And Apple lost. But uh, in that period of about uh, six years that this case was going on, uh, it may have lulled us into a bit of complacency, thinking that uh, we were going to be insulated you know, from the Windows attack. The launch of Windows 3 in 1990 killed off Apple's hopes that the Macintosh would win the GUI wars. Today we're introducing Microsoft Windows version 3. The six-year labor to produce a GUI that made IBM PCs and all the clones as easy to use as the Mac finally came up trumps. In a year, Windows 3 sold close to 30 million copies, consigning the Mac to a niche in the market. Ladies and gentlemen, the Windows 3 development team. Bill Gates' strategy won out. At every stage in the PC's development, he joined the leading hardware company and by carving out a dominant market share for his product, made his software the industry standard. You know, the original PC uh, did our evangelism and the way we created tools for that, you know, pull that together. Uh, take Windows, did we bet our company on that? Did that come together? Virtually everything we've done when we first come out with it, there's a lot of skepticism. But most of the things, we, we really stuck with them and despite all that um, second guessing, we're able to pull them off. The problem was the industry wasn't measured by who has the best selling personal computer you know, or who has the most innovative technology. The industry was measured by uh, who had the most open system that was adopted by the most other companies. And the Microsoft strategy ultimately turned out to be the better business strategy. The only problem with Microsoft is they just have no taste. They have absolutely no taste, and, and, and what that means is, I don't mean that in a small way, I mean that in a big way, in the sense that they, 
they, they don't think of original ideas and they don't bring much culture into their product. Um, and, and you say, well, wh why is that important? Well, you know, proportionally spaced fonts come from typesetting and beautiful books. That's where one gets the idea. If it weren't for the Mac, they would never have that in their products. Um, and so I, I guess I am saddened, not by Microsoft's success. I have no problem with their success. They've earned their success for the most part. I have a problem with the fact that they just make really third-rate products. I will admit, quite frankly, that I think Windows today is probably four years behind, three years behind, where it would have been had we not danced with IBM for so long. Because the amount of split energy, split work, split IQ in the company really cost our end customer real innovation in our product line. And so whenever I hear these criticisms, which I got to say sting uh, sometimes, I say to myself, just you watch, just you watch Windows 95, Windows 90. We're, there's no lack of focus. There hasn't been here for the last three, four years since we didn't have this big split with IBM. And I think even in the operating systems area, now you'll start to see clear, clear, and people will recognize clear leadership. And we, we just keep making them better. We get millions of phone calls. We get to go out there and talk to customers. And there's nothing cast in concrete. If, if people decide there's something that we should change, we, we change it. It's a lot better than, than most industries in that sense. I think the way that applications user interfaces have advanced over the last decade, Microsoft is, has been at the forefront of a very high percentage of that. And you know, I think it's, it's great stuff. On August 24, 1995, Gates delivered the coup de grace to his software rivals. Windows 95 combines the PC's operating system and its graphical interface into one package. With a worldwide promotional campaign costing $300 million, it looks set to become the industry standard, supplanting Microsoft's old warhorse, DOS. Thanks. Thanks all of you for an incredible job. Cue the triumph of Bill. A software nerd is the richest man in the world. But even as Bill Gates bestrides the PC world like a colossus, ahead lie bigger battles. Battles that will make the trouncing of the Mac and mastering the IBM PC look like a tea party. The Gates fortune was built on setting the industry standard for PC operating systems. Fine as long as PCs are standalone boxes on your desk. But now they are being linked into a worldwide network, the much hyped information superhighway. The PC on the internet is a mailbox, a telephone, and a television. Of course, at the center of this will be uh, the idea of digital convergence that is, taking all the information books, art, movies and being able to provide them. Uh, on demand on what the PC will evolve into. The Internet is the next wave of the information revolution where there is as yet no industry standard, a world where even Bill Gates seems unsure. You know, if you take the way the Internet is changing month by month, if somebody can predict what's going to happen three months from now, nine months from now, even today, uh, my hat's off to them. I think we've got a phenomena here that is moving so rapidly that nobody knows exactly where it will go. Bill Gates isn't resting on his laurels. He's making new alliances, like investing in Steven Spielberg's new movie studio, DreamWorks. It would be silly if we were going to get into the interactive business. He's in cable TV with broadcaster NBC and in competition with Rupert Murdoch and Mickey Mouse. Now, as Microsoft These tycoons are a far cry from the nerds Bill has so far outsmarted. Guys like Gary Kildall, who became businessmen by accident. Even Bill's victory over IBM was really with a corporate outpost a long way from the attention of Big Blue headquarters. No, Bill's new rivals are hotshots, not hippies. And one of them is the guy I'm visiting. He hopes the internet will go somewhere other than to Bill Gates' bottom line. He's betting it will soon consign the PC itself to the trash can and do the same to Microsoft. Bob Cringer, to see Larry Ellison.
Larry Ellison is the boss of Oracle, a booming business that sells software to companies who share information among hundreds of users. This is my favorite fish, is Halloween fish. In Atherton, the most exclusive suburb in Silicon Valley, the bachelor billionaire has built himself a $10 million samurai mansion, naturally. I want to have a large pond, about five acres of water, surrounded by several little buildings, like a village. Oh, With his ceremonial car, Larry contemplates the coming battle with Microsoft. People make a terrible mistake of thinking IBM is the present and Microsoft is the future. I think IBM is the past and Microsoft is the present and the future has not happened, so we don't know what company, what technology is going to be dominant. These are temple guardians from Kam the Kamakura period. Uh, and they, you know, you'd have one on either side of your door and the job was to, to scare employees of Microsoft away and keep them from entering the temple. We shouldn't spend all of our time wringing our hands about, you know, Microsoft, you know, Microsoft world domination that uh, there's pl still room left for innovation. There's, there's going to be change, and Microsoft's future is not assured. That's how, no. well, anything good for the Internet, huh? yeah, we're very supportive of, because the Internet does not require a PC. Larry believes the PC will be replaced with a cheap device he calls an information appliance. It will be a glorified television which will access information and computing simply by connecting to giant computers via the Internet. Just like turning on a tap, and the PC will go the way of the well and the bucket. I hate the PC with a passion. Me, me going down to the store and buying Windows 95, gotta get in my car, drive down to drive down to a store, buy a bo cardboard box full of bits, you know, you know, encoded on a piece of plastic, a CD-ROM, bring it home, read a manual, and install this thing. You must be kidding. You know, put the stuff on the net. It's bits. Don't put bits in cardboard. Cardboard in trucks. Trucks to stores. Me, you know, me go to the store. You know, pick this stuff out. It's insane. Okay, I love the internet. I want information. You know, it come, it flows across the wire. So the way ahead is wired. Larry, Bill, everybody agrees on that. And we have the nerds of the 70s to thank for making it possible, whether the PC itself survives or not. As we take up their challenge, it's worth finding out how these pioneers made out. Steve Jobs sold all his Apple stock in disgust when he was fired, but has made another fortune from his stake in a movie animation studio. He has no doubts about his contribution to humanity. If you talk to people that use the Macintosh, they love it. I mean, you don't hear people loving thing products very often, you know, really. But but you could feel it in there. There was something really wonderful there. Apple, the company Jobs took from a garage to the Fortune 500, is in trouble. It is now a fading force in the PC marketplace. Apple's other millionaire founder, Steve Wozniak, spends much of his time teaching computing to 11 and 12 year olds. IBM created the mass market for the PC, but no longer sets industry standards. And most of the guys who built IBM's first PC have left Big Blue. And Ed Roberts, who built the Altair, the very first PC, he turned his back on computing and returned to his first love, medicine. Funny, isn't it, how things turn out? After all, the first PC revolution caught us all pretty much by surprise. Even Microsoft, with 2,000 millionaires and at least two billionaires, never expected to be as successful as they are today. Cringely's universal law says society takes 30 years to adapt new technology into daily life. The phone, movies, even television took that long before our rear ends became couch-shaped. So far, the PC has had 20 years. So what comes next? Well, I'm off to find out. See you in 10 years.